Dear ma'am, thank you very much. That was much indeed a truly excellent lecture. Um, your network connections um, maps was fascinating. It was like a geographical map for me, just <laughs> staring and studying. <laughs> so, now we'll have a brief um, question and answer. Now there are roving, roving microphones. If you could please raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. And when, watch, when, I, when the microphone comes to you, if you could stand up and state your name and your organization, please. No questions as yet. Um, well, I'll get things started if you don't mind. Um, I was very interested in the wrong door support um, from Innovate UK. No, no wrong door. No wrong door. <laughs> Sorry, no wrong door support from yeah. Innovate UK. Yeah. Um, and the nine research groups. Um, did you find to see any problems with competition between the research groups or in that, in that respect? Oh, right. So, um, uh, it, so Innovate UK covers absolutely all disciplines, but has a business focus. And so for them, uh, and Chris McKern, who became chief executive of Innovate UK, what was a member of my working group. So she, when she took over Innovate UK, was steamed up and ready to implement that approach. So that was great. Um, the, the, the nine research councils, there is an issue of how you, do you deal with uh, interdisciplinarity when you've got that. And it's for that reason that this overarching um, UKRI has been put on top. And uh, the legislation to do that restructuring is working its way th um, through, um, uh, uh, through, uh, through Parliament at the moment. It hasn't been approved and that's why there's an interim uh, chair and an interim chief executive. There is, it isn't yet a legal entity. But the intention is, is by bringing them together under a, a, a common head that um, one interdisciplinary work would be facilitated. It remains to be seen whether that works because they, will all, they are also carrying on having their own um, chief executive of each research council. And so it's getting, you know, in some ways it's getting a more complicated structure uh, Mark Wolpert's a, a, a strong character, and I think he will be knocking heads to, to make sure that the, uh, uh, the, the, the whole of the uh, outfit is better than the sum of the... It, it adds value beyond that of the individual parts. But the intention is, is, is actually to facilitate those, those interactions. Currently, I, the one I'm closest to is the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council, and they've been quite good at interdisciplinarity. If they like a pro program, a pro pro project, they will often just decide to fund it and sort out how that might, the cost might be shared with other research councils later. Uh, but others are not as... Um, um, open to collaboration as they have been. Right. Yeah. And a fantastic talk in terms of looking at the landscape of where we are now, but also where the challenges are in terms of staying as a world leading economy um, in the engineering and indeed more broadly. One of the challenges that you pointed to was our educational system um, and the need possibly to re-engineer that, if I can mm. use that term, in terms of both what we teach people and where we point them in terms of where the landscape and horizons are. It's certainly one of the challenges for Northern Ireland, um, w whether it's our employers forum or our head teachers forum, one of the things that we're very actively engaged in is looking at the curriculum base and actually bringing expertise to teachers and indeed to pupils that they don't currently have. Mm -hmm. What do you think we need to do to begin to move people away from professions? We still have too many people here thinking about going into the legal profession, going into medicine, and indeed being pushed that way at the age of 12, 13, rather than, as you've said, opening up the innovation landscape that sits around some of the subject areas that you talked about? Yes, well, it, uh, uh, um, uh, there's a lot we need to do and because there's no one single thing that causes the, uh, uh, the, the, the problem. I think we certainly need to make sure that we have very strong maths and physics teachers in schools uh, uh, because that, that is at the start of it. 
Um, we, we, uh, we need to make sure, and careers advice is the wrong thing, we need to make sure that society realizes the kind of people that need to be educated for the future, because that's at the heart of it. And um, when, when you look at the way, uh, the speed in which innovations are happening and the way technology is changing the workplace, we need to have a highly skilled um, population. Yeah. And I, I think really our current school education system isn't really dealing with that. It, we make people become too narrow too early and then decisions are made without thinking about exactly where the jobs are uh, that will you know, sustain the, the quality of life that people want to have. But, but actually, all jobs require more breadth than our, our education system is really um, preparing people for. Uh, if I come back to engineering, if you allow me, but I'm, it's ex equally true in medicine, you want people who can communicate. You know, so the fact that people stop writing essays at a you know, fairly young age is not the best way of educating engineers either. So actually, maybe something as serious and life-changing as Brexit is the right time to, to, to look again at, at education. Um, because we've got by by importing uh, people with skills from the rest of the world, but that's not a great thing uh, for you know for for our own people. And we go uh, um, and I think probably the referendum result showed dissatisfaction um, from of the public with that. So if we're really going to grow and make it a good country for everyone, we need we need to be aligning uh, the population with the, the with the jobs of the future. And that, that's a serious, thoughtful business that we need to get down to brass roots. And you know, we've got our backs against the wall. This is the time to address it. Uh, Roger Downer from the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, I'm interested in the growth aspect of your talk. It seems to me that we, we're pretty good at developing spin-outs and small, medium-sized operations. What we don't seem to be able to do is to grow these from the 100 million in sales to the billion uh, euro of sales. Uh, I'd be interested in your perspective of this, or why this might be so, and what we need to do to help our small, successful companies grow. Well, I, 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 um, I, I'm not the, um, the greatest uh, expert, but, but the Green Paper does try to address this in saying what we need to do is, is to grow sources of patient money. Um, now, when you actually talk to those that, that are substantial uh, investors, they, they, they say it's not the lack of money, it's the lack of ambition. And that, that, that many of those who found companies are happy once it grows to the few hundred million to sell out. Um, and if you actually look at where the maximum benefits for the individual involved, it may well be at that stage. Um, so it, it's, it's, I think it's, it's it, I don't have the answer, but it, part of it has to be making sure that the um, um, patient capital is there and willing to invest. But actually, I, I think there's also an element. Um, um, entrepreneurship is, is almost like a, um, it, it's catching. And uh, when you have, um, and Cambridge has become quite an entrepreneurial hub, it, when you have activities growing, people compete with one another. And it, it's partly, I think, it's building that um, element of, um, of expectation about what can be done um, by, by those who are, um, you know, are, are setting off companies. We have, as you say, we have some great companies, but, but often they, they sell out at no few hundred uh, million scale. And, and then, you know, their, their subsequent um, um, growth can, can flourish, but sometimes it doesn't after that big takeover. So it's quite a risk. It is, it's, not an, it's not an easy answer, I'm afraid. And uh, John, John McKenney from Queen's University. Um, thinking about the report and thinking about the industrial strategy, I was just wondering, is there a danger that we keep doing things the way we've always done and expecting the world to change? Or is perhaps there is a need for a more, much more radical thought processes, i.e. 
you know, universities have always been structured one way. Uh, the links with business have been structured kind of the same way. Uh, if we take an industrial strategy that gets research councils that operate the same way, uh, all, all very good, but perhaps we, what we now need to do is, is stand back and take a much more lateral thinking approach, a much more radical thinking approach as to where what we, these are the processes, but what's the end, the end game and how can we work back from that? I don't have the solution, but I would be interested in your thoughts. I think it's an interesting point. I mean, in some ways, it feels that there is a lot of radical change going on at the moment. I mean, I think the research councils um, and, and many academics feel that restructuring into UKRI uh, is quite a perturbation on the system. Bringing Innovate UK under the same boss as the research councils is quite risky. Um, so there are attempts to change. Um, I, uh, I think in some areas, the, the, the previous industrial strategy, the Vince Cable industrial strategy, has worked really well. It's worked well for aerospace uh, and for automotive. Um, I, I'm, one of my concerns is almost the opposite, that every time a government comes in, it feels it has to do something with industrial strategy that's different. And I do think that the green paper it, it at least acknowledges where areas have worked in the past. I think for, for business that almost the, what you don't want is to keep changing. Uh, and you know, if you take France or Germany, Germany in particular, it's been consistency over decades. That really gives business the confidence to invest. Uh, I think it's actually unfortunate that every time a government changes, there's kind of um, you, the feel that you can't say anything worked well before. So I'm, I'm not sure that I, I agree with the, the radical, or at least we shouldn't throw out the things that are working. I think that what we have on offer from the government, it's not, uh, currently it's not a finished thing, and they're waiting to be pushed about what, how, what, basically it's an, it's an offer for business and university to come together uh, uh, and there's so much in it, it won't all happen, but actually pick out what they might do under those 10 pillars. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to, to, to change it in particular directions. But at the core, continuity is important too. Uh, Bill Grimson, Engineers Ireland. Uh, Dr. Downer asked a question, and you used the word in response, ambition and expectation. I wonder, do we have a problem in these islands on the whole area of risk, being too risk averse, being afraid of failure? Possibly. Um, yeah, uh, possibly. I, I don't know. I think it, it, it's actually also, uh, I mean, the, the, the thing commonly said, it's, it's much easier to let, have a business fail in, in the US because, you know, bankruptcy is not such a, you, you don't have the same personal um, impact of, of a, a, a company failing as, as you do in the, in the UK. So I think, it, you know, our structures don't help. I think also, um, I, I, I don't know how to phrase this, that I'm not sure that in the UK we particularly want to make pots of money. Um, I mean, we want, everyone wants to have enough money to be successful, but the US can be very driven to be a billionaire. I'm not sure that, that in the UK that we that that's actually what most people aspire to. So I think maybe the personal aim to have a really, uh, you know, to, to, to grow your company to be a multinational, um, global, large corporate is perhaps not as strong in our psyche as it is in, in the US. Before I invite um, Dermot Byrne, Engineers Ireland President, up to make a final closing, I'd just like to get a quick plug-in of our future events. Um, on Tuesday the 14th of March, in association with the Ulster University McGee campus in the west of our region, we have Professor Baswajet Basu, Trinity College Dublin, delivering an evening lecture on renewable energy systems. We also have our annual dinner at the Hilton here in Belfast in Lanyon Place on the Friday the 31st of March. 
Um, following the conferring ceremony, there will be an opportunity to network and try your luck at our casino tables. And there's a live jazz band, fantastic prizes, and partners are very much welcome. On the 10th of April, we have a joint lecture with I Struck D on the All State Insurance Headquarters building in Maysfield, Belfast, at the Peter Frogger Centre. Um, without further ado, I'll ask Dermot Byrne to come up and make a final closing. Thank you, Ronan. Um, I, think, I think we'll all agree that we have been deeply honoured, I think, today to hear uh, Dayman Dowling um, present on universities' innovation and growth uh, in Queen's University here. Um, as President of Engineers Ireland, I would like to thank you, Dayman, uh, for a simply outstanding presentation. Um, I think your thought leadership are you know, so evident here tonight, but they're shaping opinion, they're shaping policy, and they're shaping action. Um, I think it's very appropriate that you gave that lecture here in Q Queen's University, um, which, as we heard from the Vice-Chancellor, is evolving to be a powerhouse in research and innovation on these islands. So I think it's a perfect constellation of the two. Um, your work as President of the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK and as Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Cambridge, I believe is inspiring many people, and particularly women, to push the limits of what, what they can achieve in these uh, STEM-type uh, um, careers. Um, Engineers Ireland is delighted to have this collaboration with Queen's University in Belfast each year and running for the last 16 years. Um, to honour the pioneer, pioneering engineer that was Sir Bernard Crossland, and on this occasion to bring Dayman's highly important topic to a public forum for a wider discussion. Um, just to pick up on maybe some of the themes in your presentation, I think the words collaboration looms large, and I think if there was a word cloud for tonight, <laughs> collaboration would dominate the screen, there's no doubt about it. Um, and I think that collaboration you know, with industries and, and, and with industry and academia, with universities, across universities and different colleges, um, I think is absolutely key to the future um, of, our, of, of success in growth and innovation. Um, I'm delighted you touched on the whole area of Brexit, which is such a, such a big topic for us all on these islands, for, for the UK, for Ireland. Um, we, we, I think we have different challenges, but I think you've really highlighted the challenges, but you've also highlighted the opportunities. And I think um, an organisation like um, Engineers Ireland, we have chapters in, in Ireland, in Northern Ireland and in the UK. I think, um, for me, that will be key to ensuring that that collaboration continues. I mean, that collaboration between practitioners on these islands has been there for nearly 200 years, and it's not going to stop post-Brexit, uh, and long may it continue. I think um, your, your, your thoughts on simplifying the ecosystem, the research and innovation ecosystem, I think will, will resonate with many of us here in the room today. I think anybody who's had to go through the process of applying for a H2020 grant, or any of the, you know, as you say, barriers are there, but we need to kind of simplify that system. And maybe just finally, just I think, one of your slides, you had number one, personal relationships. That, to me, struck a chord. And I think that's where, um, where uh, institutions like Engineers Ireland, to the relationships we have between the UK, between Northern Ireland, between the Republic, I think they are so strong. And we need to make sure that we, we maintain those very strong relationships through what is going to be a difficult time um, over the next number of years. Um, and of course skills, um, a huge issue for all of us on the island, uh, on, on this island and on the UK. Um, uh, and it's very appropriate that you mention that we're about to embark on our engineers week uh, on, from the 3rd of March through the, for a whole week, uh, where we are getting out into schools, um, getting industry involved, getting academia involved, getting engineers, young engineers involved in talking to young people and, <coughs> and hopefully inspiring the next generation of people who will, who will take the, the, um, the agenda of innovation forward. 
So, um, <clears throat> I would like to thank Vice Chancellor of Queen's University, uh, Belfast, Professor Patrick Johnson, um, the Chairman of our Engineers, uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland Region, Ronan Boyle, and uh, especially the Sir, Ber Sir Bernard Crossland Committee, and all those who make this annual lecture possible, and my sin sincere thanks to all of you. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending. I have one more job to do, and that is to make a presentation to Dayman. So if I could invite you to, to, uh, to come to the podium, Dayman. Um, <clears throat> now, if I reach down here. Um, this award has been designed, produced, and donated by the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences at Queen, Queen's University, Belfast. And I'm delighted to present this to you. you. So. It's absolutely stunning. It's so can I again just thank you all for attending. It's been a wonderful night and safe home everybody. Thank you.